Hi, this is Sean D'Souza, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation Podcast. This podcast isn't some magic trick about how to work less. Instead, it's about how to really enjoy the work that you do and to enjoy your vacation time. This is Sean D'Souza, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation. When you're at a derby, you notice something interesting. Every single horse bolts out of the gate all at once. But wait, that's not interesting, is it? That's what horses are supposed to do. They're expected to race madly towards the finish line so that they can win the championship. Which is fine for horses, but terrible for landing pages. On a landing page, the first thing you present your client with is the biggest problem. Now, if you were to treat your landing page like the horse derby, then all the problems would try to outdo each other in the very first paragraph. Like horses thundering towards the finish line, they would all attempt to get ahead of each other. And this causes a problem for the client looking at your landing page. Suddenly, that client is faced with a ton of information hitting him all at once. It's why clients leave your landing page. They become disoriented, but mostly overwhelmed. On any sales or landing page, your job is to present the client with the biggest problem. A client gets interested in your product or service because you're taking on a specific problem. And it's that problem that needs to rise to the surface. A landing page is more like a layered cake than horses at a horse derby. There needs to be a sequence of ideas presented one after the other based on their importance. And yet, this restriction causes a real headache. Because most products and most services solve multiple problems, don't they? So how do you choose which problem to use? And what do you do with the rest of the problems? Do you just drop them or do you use them elsewhere? That's what we're about to find out as we go on this journey of isolating the problem. However, it's not a very long journey. We've got three simple steps that will enable us to get a more precise landing page. We'll find out where the customer gets confused and how to eliminate that confusion. So what are the three things that we're going to cover today? The three things that we're going to cover today are how to choose one problem, defining why that problem is important, and finally, what to do with the rest of the problems. When I was about 10 years old, I wanted to be a pilot. In fact, I can't remember anyone at school who didn't want to be a pilot. However, for most of us growing up in India, a trip to the airport was mostly out of the question. This is because air travel was not as frequent or inexpensive as it is at this point in time. However, on the rare occasions that I did get to the airport, it was fascinating to watch the planes land and take off. But what was most interesting of all was how the planes circled the airport. Planes circle for a reason. Air traffic controllers exist for a reason. You too are an air traffic controller when it comes to your landing page. In fact, it's pretty ironic that it's called a landing page in the first place, isn't it? Ironic, because so many of us are keen to make sure all those planes land at the very same time. Circling planes don't run out of fuel in a hurry, so let them circle a bit. And then you get one plane down 
safely on the tarmac and then the other and then the other. So what are these planes anyway? The planes are simply the problems that you're presenting to the client. When we say problems, a negative connotation pops to mind immediately, doesn't it? But that's what you're doing on your landing page. You're bringing to light the biggest problem so that you can get the attention of the client. For instance, let's take the headline from the product on pricing that we have on Psychotactics. Now, it's called dartboard pricing. The headline reads like this. How do you systematically raise prices without losing customers? Did you notice the problem in the headline? You can feel that pain of not raising prices, can't you? You know that you would like to raise your prices, but you're holding back because you're not sure how your clients will react. It's possible that you will lose some of them, or maybe the entire clientele will walk out in droves. What we've done in that headline, and a little bit of that explanation, is define the main problem. And when you read that headline, you can feel the emotion. You can get the point. However, you can only get the point when you look at it from an air traffic controller system tower. When you sit down to write your headline, you are suddenly faced with all these circling planes. And you feel the need to land them all together. An inexperienced writer, they will bring out all the problems within the first few lines or within the first few paragraphs itself. And as you can tell from an air traffic controller point of view, this is a recipe for disaster. The first thing we have to do is decide which problem is the most powerful of them all. It's only the most evocative problem that will get the attention of the customer. But how do we know which one is interesting to the customer? The way we go about this exercise is to first list all the solutions, all the bullet points together. We now have a bunch of bullet points or features that we can work through. So let's take an example of a product that I use for recording this podcast. If you decide to do any recording, you're going to have a sort of echo. When you sit in a restaurant and you find it extremely noisy, what you're experiencing is the amazing ability of sound to bounce off surfaces. To avoid sounding like you're recording in the bathtub, you either have to put in foam tiles on your walls, like they do in professional studios, or you have to have some sound reduction system. My Google search led me to Holland Hogan's Porter Booth Pro. Yes, it cost me a whopping $350 to buy the Porter Booth, but I don't like putting stuff together. So there are tutorials that show you how to do all this stuff online, but I would rather cook a six-course meal for two weeks in a row than to put stuff like that together. To get some foam tiles, put them up on the wall, worry about disfiguring the wall, and then getting random results, that didn't sound like my idea of fun. So I got the porter boot. But this isn't a story of why I bought the porter boot. What we're looking for is the benefits and the features that can be turned around to help you create your first paragraphs of text. And of course, your headline. So when we look at the Porter Booth on Amazon, it reads like a lot of Amazon pages. There are a few bullet points and you have to make a decision to buy a $350 product based on these bullet points. And like horses at a derby, all four or five bullet points seem to dart out simultaneously. So let's take a look at the Amazon page and see what we find. And now I'm gonna read the bullet points. It's not very interesting, but let's read it. So it has a rugged 600 denier fabric, only seven pounds. Air travel checks as carry-on luggage. It's 120% larger than the Porter Booth Plus. 
its unique sound auditorium design. And it goes on and on and on. And you can read it at Amazon if you like. However, there is a Dobby syndrome there. What are you going to choose when you sit there and you read that page as a prospective client? Now, if you've already decided the problem that needs solving, you're still struggling because it's hard to figure out which of the bullet points get your attention. And if you look closely, it's part of the third bullet point. It's there, it's slinking at the back of the sentence. So let me light up the importance of the third point for you. And here's what it says. It says, the number one choice of recording pros worldwide. So that's it. That's all that's required to get the attention of the customer. When you look closely, you realize what is happening when that specific solution or benefit is turned into a problem. As a solution or a bullet point, the fact that it's the number one choice of recording professionals, it's pretty boring. But when you turn it into a problem, it immediately gets the attention of the prospective client. The problem would read like this. When you're on the road, do you end up in a closet trying to get a great recording? And the subhead would be, when you're a voiceover artist, only the best sound will do for a recording studio. But we will try to reduce the noise by propping up pillows, by searching desperately for rooms with thick curtains. And instead, the porta booth is like the equivalent of a mobile recording studio. It reduces all those unwanted sounds and annoyances. Even in a very quiet room, and this applies to homes and apartments too, you can get this big, boomy, box-like sound to your microphone instead of the tight sound that you get in the studio. And that's because in addition to picking up the sound of your voice directly, the microphone can also hear the ambient sound and this becomes the room from hell. Instead of battling with pillows and getting stuck in dark closets, here's what many professionals do on the road. They take their studio as carry-on luggage, no matter where they go. See how different you feel about that very same bullet? So it's the problem, the biggest problem, which is the key to getting the client's attention. Yet. How do you choose that biggest problem? Most of us are too close to our product or service, and in many cases we can't see why clients choose us. We think we know, and that's what we put on our sales page. But often, more often than not, we're hopelessly wrong. For instance, let's look at the page on Black Belt Presentations. Now, this is the product that we sell off our website. It's about presentations, how to make great presentations. It shows you why you fall asleep when most presenters get on stage. It shows you how to design your slides, how to control your audience, how to structure your presentation, and yet look at the headline. The biggest problem says, when you make a presentation, wouldn't it be amazing to completely control the room without turning anyone off? Then the subhead says, It's rough enough to have to speak to an audience, but aren't you always in awe of presenters who can bring the room to life? How do you create presentations that enthrall, hold, and move an audience to action? Notice how excited you were by that headline and subhead? It's not exciting, is it? Because instead of doing a target profile interview, instead of going out there and understanding what clients want, we've continued to sell the product as if everyone is doing presentations on stage. And yes, for years since its release, the product has been bought by people doing presentations, but the world has changed in the sense that many of us do webinars. We do podcasts, don't we? A reliable webinar software like GoToMeeting costs over $250 a year. And yet, 
If your presentation isn't amazing, what have you lost? You've lost the money that you pay for the software, the time, the effort, and all because your presentation isn't doing what it's supposed to do. Now, webinars aren't news. They've been around for ages. Many of our clients could tell me right off that they rarely, if ever, get on stage. Yet, they're more likely to give a webinar to a client or be part of a webinar series. And guess what? The lack of focus in that headline and that subhead is not only causing us to sell less product, but also depriving you, the client, of increasing your sales. And how did I figure this out? How did I figure out that this headline needed to be changed? I got an email from a client and he told me how he used it for his webinar and how he got the audience to respond amazingly well. And there I am, trying to procrastinate. I know, I should get down to changing that headline. I should change those subheads. I should change that first paragraph. And I'm betting you have the same problem. You want to put off talking to your client and then making those quick changes. But as you can see, even on the Psychotactics website, how we are making this mistake and how we need to fix this mistake. We can't fix this mistake ourselves. We need to go to the client because the answer doesn't lie with you. It lies with the client. But what if you don't have a client? In that case, you go to a random person. And how does this make sense? Why approach a random person? What would you expect to find with any random person? This takes us to our second part, which is defining why the problem is important. Hello, I'm a Mac. And I'm a PC. Hey, Mac, did you hear the good news? Right. Windows 7 is out, and it's not going to have any of the problems my last operating system had. Trust me. I feel like I've heard this before, PC. What? Windows Vista's here, and it's not going to have any of the problems that Windows XP had. It's not going to have any of the problems that Windows ME had. It's not going to have any of the problems that Windows 98 had. It's not going to have any of the problems Windows 95 had. It's not going to have any of the problems Windows 2 had. Trust me. This time it's going to be different. Trust me. There's a reason why I moved from the PC to the Mac. In 2008, I had to do a series of presentations for a radio station. Since the client of the radio station were always looking for ways to get the attention of their clients, the presentation of the Brain Audit seemed like the perfect match. If there's one thing I'm very possessive about, it's the slides for my presentation. I tend to make changes, I simplify the content, and then I move the slides around until the very last minute. Even if I've done the presentation dozens of times before, you can be sure that I will be making changes at the very last minute. In this case, the terms of the contract were very simple. They prohibited me from making those changes at the very last minute. The radio station was putting all the slides together in advance so that all the slide decks had to be submitted the week before the presentation. Now, this rattled me because I wasn't used to it. So I showed up three hours before I had to make my presentation. The technical crew was more than happy to let me do a run through of my presentation on the big screen. And this is before any of the clients showed up. So I clicked through the slides and I realized something was wrong. The presentation I was seeing on the screen looked like my presentation, but somehow it was different. The weird part was that it looked better than what I had done. After I got over the shock of someone tampering with my presentation, I asked the crew how they had gone about changing the presentation. We didn't do anything with the presentation itself, they said. We just ran it through Keynote, which is the presentation software for the Mac. That one idea was enough to get me hooked onto the Mac, even though I'd used the PC for more than 15 years. The Mac had solved a problem that I didn't know existed. It had taken the best possible presentation I could muster and made it far more beautiful than I could ever imagine. Since then, I have dumped all my PCs and I've stuck to the Mac. 
So does this make me an ideal client? It does not, because I wasn't aware of the problem in advance. To find the ideal client, you have to find someone who is already deeply aware of the frustration that they are facing. If you find someone like me, someone who's surprised, someone who's delighted, you're going to get a very shallow rendition of the problems that the client faces. And most certainly, you're never going to get to the depth of the biggest problem. You have to find someone who already has the problem. And the best place to start could be in a random place like Facebook. Since everyone already has an opinion on Facebook, you may shortlist your ideal client based on a friend that responds to your question. You may have a tiny list of subscribers on your email list, and if you send out a request, there's a pretty good chance that at least a couple of responses will show up in your inbox. If you already have clients like we do, well, you're still like a newbie, especially when you're launching a new product or service. So you still have to act like someone who's new. So often people come to me and they say, well, I don't have any clients. Well, we do have clients, but when you're launching a new product, a new service, they haven't tested it out. So you have to get someone with the frustration level rather than having used your product or service. What is that inbuilt frustration level? Let's say we want to launch a product on how to take outstanding photos with your iPhone. You go out and you find the frustration. You don't look at someone who's going to read your book, who's going to look at your course. You're going to find that frustration. In many cases, you might already know such a person. You might already have this great client. But what you're looking for, as I said, is the frustration. And once you can find that, you go and interview them over the phone. And then you will very quickly get the series of frustrations that they have with their iPhone. Let's say they have a list like this. So they want to take great food pictures. They want to improve their vacation pictures. They want to use the manual controls. They want to shoot macro photography. They want great portrait photography. They want to dump the SLR at home and still take outstanding pictures with the iPhone. The problem is obvious, isn't it? They want to do everything, but how do you choose? All of these problems head in divergent directions. And the answer is you don't choose. You get the client to choose. You focus on the problem at hand and then you dig deeper. So the questions would hinge on a single problem. And that is, say, how to dump the SLR at home and take outstanding photos with your iPhone. Now, that would be my problem. If you own a Nikon like I do, a Nikon 7000, you'll find that you're leaving the camera back at the hotel room a lot. The Nikon 7000, it's a great camera, but it feels like you're lugging a brick. And when you take three months off, like we do, three months is 30 into three, which is 90 days of lugging a brick along. So unless I'm going on a trip, like the time when we went to see orcas in Vancouver or camels on the road in Australia, I keep the DSLR, that's the Nikon, I just keep it back in the hotel room. And once you get me started, I can keep going on and on and on about the problems of a heavy camera. However, as the interviewer digs deeper, she may find that I like the iPhone for other reasons as well. I can use a slew of software, I can improve my photos, I can use filters, I can create depth of field, and I can do all of this before I get back to the hotel. With the Nikon, I have to get back, I have to download the photos in a program like Lightroom, then I'm chained to my computer and I'm not enjoying my vacation. So you've got to dig into that simple problem or that single problem, you've got to land that one plane and you have to say, ask the questions about that single problem. So the questions would be like this, why do you want to take your iPhone instead of an Nikon? What frustrates you when you take the Nikon? Can you describe a day on your vacation? What are the consequences of taking a heavy camera along? 
Now what's happening here is we're delving deep into one single problem and that makes a huge difference because suddenly what you've got is this factor of me going deep into that problem and feeling that emotion and that frustration and really that is what sells your product not a dozen bullet points what sells your product is that one big problem and you've gone one inch wide and one mile deep so what you're doing is you're taking the biggest problem you're putting it in your headline you're putting it in your subhead you're putting it in the first paragraph and this leaves us in a sort of dilemma, doesn't it? What do we do with all the rest of the problems? All of those other things like, you know, I wanted to take great food butchers, I wanted to improve my manual controls, all of the other things. Do we just chuck it away? What do we do with it? This takes us to our third part, which is what to do with the rest of the problems. And that brings us prematurely to the end of this podcast. Well, we'll continue this podcast in the second episode, and we will learn more about the landing page. In this episode, we looked at how to choose one problem, and then we saw how you have to define why that problem is important. And when we looked at one problem, we saw it was a lot like landing planes. You have to land one plane at a time. The second thing that we saw was, why was that problem important? We have to define, why is that problem important? Don't just go bouncing from that problem to the next problem to the next problem, but bring home the consequences of that problem. And that's when you get the attention of the customer. You want to get that attention and you want to keep that attention. And this is why the problem becomes so critical. So those are the two parts. And the third part is what are we going to do with the rest of the problems? Because we have other problems. So what are we going to do with them? But for this episode, let's just look at that one action plan that you can take. And the one thing that you can do is you can define what is that one problem that you have. So make a list of all the problems that you have and then go to the client and ask them which problem gets their attention. But better still, don't do any of the stuff yourself. Just go to the client, ask them all the problems that they're having with a product or a service, the frustration that they're having with a product or a service, get them to list it, get them to rank it, and get them to tell you all the consequences of not having a solution for that problem. That client or somebody off Facebook is going to do a much better job than you sitting at your desk and trying to figure things out. What else is happening in Psychotactics land? Well, you probably heard the article writing course sold out almost immediately. I think I told you that on the last podcast, but hey, I'm still excited. 24 hours, that's pretty good. And we're doing this without affiliates, without any joint ventures, without anything at all. So how do we do this? Is it the landing page? Ironically, a lot of the clients don't read the landing page. This is so interesting. So what is it that's happening? What's happening is that we're taking clients through a sequence. We're taking clients through the subscribers. They're buying the brain audit. They come into 5000 BC. They see how much value they get at 5000 BC, how they can just post some question and then they get a whole answer to it. They get a series of articles. It freaks them out a bit because they don't get any of the support anywhere else. It's ongoing support almost minute to minute in a way, but you'll find that out for yourself. So 5000 BC, that's the place you wanna be. You have to get on the waiting list. You know that if you've been listening to the podcast. The second thing is the cartooning course. Now, if you think that, hey, I can't draw any cartoons. Well, it's coming up. Here's your chance. You can prove to yourself that you can draw cartoons because we've had hundreds of people who've done the course and hundreds of people who have become cartoonists. Not just mediocre cartoonists, but excellent cartoonists. And you can see some of their work in 5000 BC, but also on psychotactics.com slash 
Da Vinci, that's D-A-V-I-N-C-I, Da Vinci, like Leonardo Da Vinci. So you want to become a good cartoonist? This is your chance. Prove to yourself that you can draw, that you can achieve that talent. We also have the information products course coming up. It's about book creation. That's later in the year, but I'm just letting you know in advance. And yes, we've got the New Zealand workshop. That's at psychotactics.com x 2017. So that's going to fill up pretty quickly once we start marketing it. So take a look at the page. Not much of a landing page, only six lines on the page. But those who know us are going to come to this workshop and it's about how to make your landing page even more effective. So this is all about landing pages for some reason. I don't know how this happened, but the workshop is about landing pages. The article writing workshop was about landing pages. This whole podcast was about landing pages. And, you know, back in 2002, I didn't know how to write a landing page, but I learned and you can learn too and you can find out what makes your landing page effective. But more importantly, you get to New Zealand and you get to drink wine and see New Zealand. And that's on almost everyone's bucket list. Don't let it be on a bucket list because bucket lists are depressing. You want to get on that plane, come to New Zealand. That's psychotactics.com slash x2017. Bye for now. Oh yeah, and the next episode, we continue. So tune in for the next episode and part three, and then a summary of this entire landing page episode. Yeah, bye for now, really. Bye-bye.